بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا So welcome everyone to our open question and answer session I have about uh, almost 30 questions uh, this evening So we'll begin inshallah and these are in no order Of course all the questions are anonymous uh, Somebody wrote in and asks if I am a repeat customer at a store and they give me a refer a friend discount offer, for example, 25% off of a sweater, can I tell my friend to use that offer to buy something for me using the 25% discount? I'd pay my friend back, of course. Is that dishonest haram thing to do? Because technically I've then used the new customer offer, but I'm not a new customer. Well, there are a few ways to answer the question. If the Sometimes these offers, there are terms, uh, and that's sort of the fine print. So if it says in the terms specifically that you can't do something like that, then that would be dishonest. But if it's just a, you know, one of those email coupon things and uh, you do what you said, that wouldn't be dishonest. As a matter of fact, that might be advantageous to the store because then they're increasing uh, their sales. So unless the terms specifically say that you can't do that, that it's uh, single use only, uh, non-transferable, th that kind of language, if that's the case, then it would be impermissible because the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ghashana falaysa minna, whoever tricks us is not from amongst us. But as I said, if it's an open situation, then that would be fine. And, and next question, can we pray, can we pray for people who have passed away, or say, Allah have, Allah have mercy on people who have passed who are not Muslim. So we've had a question like this in the past, you know, about praying for people that are not Muslim. What we learn from our teachers is when somebody asks this question is we remember the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. Allah ta'ala says in the Quran, my mercy encompasses everything, everything and everybody. So the Muslim and the non-Muslim, the believer and the non-believer, the human being and the earth and the inanimate objects. So asking for Allah's rahma for somebody is not asking for Allah's forgiveness for somebody. So this is the, the, the people that ask this question or the people that think that it's haram to send mercy or you know you have a neighbor that died you say oh you know may Allah have mercy on them or God have mercy on them the reason they have a problem is that they are confusing the two things because of the verses in the Quran that Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam was forbidden for seeking istighfar for his uncle Azar not rahmah asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah is something that Allah himself has guaranteed in the Quran and he says rahmati wa inna wa rahmati wa si'at kulla shay my mercy encompasses everything that is not asking for istighfar so therefore there's not a problem with that also keep in mind that on yom al qiyamah sayyidina muhammad sallallahu will intercede on all of humanity's behalf muslim and non-muslim he will intercede to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on behalf of everybody isn't this a form of rahmah as well so on and so forth so we are uh, merciful people, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ar-Rahimun Yarhamuhum Ar-Rahman, the merciful ones are given mercy from the merciful one. Irhamuman fil ard yarhamkum man fil sama, have mercy for all those on earth, Allah will show you mercy, the one in the heavens will show you mercy. So therefore, you know, you have a neighbor, or maybe there are families in which there are mixed faiths, and somebody passes away, there's nothing wrong with asking for God's mercy. And especially saying that when you're with people, the family of the deceased. Okay, next question. Can we do ibadah like hajj or otherwise other Islamic deeds with the intention of the reward going to the people who have passed away who are not Muslim? No, you can do the acts of worship for those people who are Muslim, like your family or your parents or grandparents, uh, etc. Uh, but not for non-Muslims because they did not believe in the message <clears throat> of Islam or the details of Islam, but rather we can ask for Allah Ta'ala's mercy. If we encounter other Muslims who have different opinions from us in regards to Islam, what cor course of action do you recommend? Is it best to give resources or links to scholars that will obviously know more than us or try to speak from our own understanding? 
or is it best to disengage from these discussions? It depends who you are who's asking this question. If you're part of our community and somebody bothers you, you tell them to speak to me. That's my job in this community. And I take that heat and I will sit down with them and I'll talk to them politely if they're polite and not so politely if they're not so polite. But if you don't know and you're just, uh, you know, just a regular congregant and you, you say your prayers and you say your fasting and so on and so forth. And then, <clears throat> and then you meet somebody out of the blue and they tell you everything that you're doing is haram. Probably the best thing is not to engage with them because you won't know where they're coming from or you could create more problems. But if somebody <clears throat> sees you do something and they say, why are you doing such and such? And you say, oh, the imam at our mosque taught, taught us such and such. Then you, that's the extent of what you've referred them to the source of who taught you. And that's enough. In general, even with my own students who study with me, in general, I favor disengagement because of another reason. And I don't know if I've shared this story with you, but I'll share the story again. Uh, and if it's uh, the first time you hear it, then it's the first time you hear it. And I'm going to share the story without any names because, you know, we're not here to offend anybody, but I'm using this as a teaching moment. <clears throat> I was with uh, my teacher, who at the time was the Grand Mufti of Egypt. We were in England at attending some kind of function or conference. I can't remember the exact function. And there was a very prominent American imam at the conference. And it was very friendly and everything. So when I was with the Sheikh, me and another friend of mine, we were in his room at night or having tea or something. I mentioned to him an opinion that this American imam has, which is a very bizarre opinion. And I you know, don't want to mention it, but it's, it's something, you know, it's like saying up is down and down is up. It's something very basic like that. So the sheikh looked at me and was like, there's no way that he says that. I said, no, wallahi, maulana, he says such and such. So the next day at dinner or at lunch, uh, I saw the sheikh go sit next to this uh, American imam uh, to talk to him about this issue. And the sheikh sat down with the imam. It was like no, no more than like two minutes or something. And then the sheikh came back. So I was like, you know, want to know what happened. And he looked at me. He's like, yeah, he actually does say what you said. I said, and? He's like, I left him. I was like, what do you mean you left him? That was the whole reason why I told you about this. So you can go convince him. I said, why did you do that? Why did you leave him? And he said, you have to understand that this, this man... His whole Islam is based on this way of thinking. If I try to reconstruct for him this opinion, it's a fiqhi opinion. If I try to deconstruct for him this opinion, the, the imam was a convert. It might lead him outside of Islam. He's like, and we don't want to do that. And he does a lot of good, and many people become Muslim because of him. He guides his community other than this one issue, so it's best to leave him. So this is a lesson that I learned early on, is that when you engage with people, there are two issues that you have, three issues that you have to keep in mind. Number one is you have to have knowledge of that which you are talking about, not something that you inherited or, or you just assume. You have to really know the detail of the issue. Number, and that you, are, you just have to acquire knowledge. It's not a secret. Number two is you have to be very careful to ascertain if this person is making a simple mistake or their entire way of being is based on this way of thinking, in which case you can create more of a danger. And number three, and most important, you have to remove yourself from the equation. You're not here to debate so you can feel good about yourself. You're here to correct a misconception or something like that. So for this reason, I advise even my students, even those that study fiqh and usul fiqh with me, I advise them not to engage at all until they are ready to sit and teach and, and whatnot. So if those are students of knowledge, and I remember when I was a student, and I still am a student in many respects, very rarely would we engage because every time we come to engage, I ask myself, do I know all of the, issue, the, all of the opinions or is there an opinion that I don't know? Even the Shia opinion, is there a Shia uh, dispensation for this act or not? I said, well, I don't know. I have to go look it up. So I feel like I don't want to engage. And for the people in the congregation to repeat, if people are within our family, the wider ICCP family, you can always refer them back to me. And that's my role uh, amongst you, inshallah. One of my roles amongst you, inshallah. Okay. You have mentioned uh, before that people in successful uh, Muslim relationships will have shared fundamental principles. What are some ways that we could see 
if a potential partner shares our principles? What are some specific topics or questions that you think should be discussed before marriage? <clears throat> well, usually the principles can be ascertained through, through uh, occurrences and, and incidents. So when you go to somebody's house or you go out together or you're buying this or you know just in the interaction, that's where you can determine how somebody's principles, like for example, is somebody uh, stingy or generous? You can, you can read, especially women are very good at this. They can read. Do they bring a gift to the house or they don't bring a gift at all? Or do they bring a gift from Trader Joe's or do they bring a gift from Whole Foods or do they bring flowers or do they pluck flowers from your front yard? Or <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you can tell by what they bring if, there's, if they're generous. And then maybe there's a family gathering and you go out. So I'm just giving an example about this quality of being generous of stingy. Uh, again, some people that are stingy, uh, it, it's not that they're stingy, but they're frugal, for example. Maybe they come from a simple background and you know they're saving everything to get married and things like that. So you also have to understand the background of the person. But it's through those occurrences, through talking and through doing certain things together, that you will be able to learn. So don't underestimate that. Also just speaking about, you know, what do you want from a family? What's important for you? What are you looking for? What are you studying? What do you do? Things like that. Based on people's answers, you can tell. There used to be a science called Ilmul Farasa, the science of Farasa. Farasa is that you could look at somebody's face and know everything about them. And uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he was one of the people who was very good at this. So when I learned, because I'm a chef, and when I learned this, I wanted to, I was like, oh, if I can learn how to read people's faces, then I'll be a master. I can. So I told my chef, I said, I want to learn Ilm al farasa And he laughed at me. He's like, that doesn't exist anymore because of the chemicals that we consume and the medicines that we take and the, the you know, GMOs and food and, and the cell phones. And we have, our futures as human beings have changed. But there used to be the ability that if a man or let's say I'm, I want to get married, my mother, sister, aunt, uh, et cetera, could, lo could look at a woman's face and just by her basic natural features know almost everything about her physical qualities and her character traits. So we might not be able to do that, looking at people's faces now, but we can observe how people function in different uh, circumstances and then deduce from that some of their principles in addition, asking, you know, the fundamental questions about family, children, rearing, you know, so on and so forth. It's a big question. I mean, we need a class on, on marriage and relationships. It's kind of hard to do this in just one sitting. We'll do that, inshallah, after Ramadan. Some muftis say even wishing someone Merry Christmas is forbidden. What kind of mufti is going to say? Then he's not a mufti. He's a Google mufti. Also, in this country, we do not want to alienate our kids from Christmas and New Year favorites. Festivities, sorry. So we also have Christmas trees in the house and Santa comes in the night, leaves gifts. Is, is this forbidden? My kid asked me if Santa was a Muslim and I replied, maybe. I don't know. I said Santa is a secret. My kid insisted that Santa was a Muslim as he wore a cap. How do we, we had a good laugh and everybody was happy. We exchange gifts at Ramadan and give sweets to our non-Muslim neighbors. And my neighbors bring us gifts and sweets in Diwali. Surely we can give at Christmas gifts, can't we? This uh, question uh, falls under a larger topic, which is can we uh, wish people of other faiths good wishes and happy holidays during their special times? So what do we find in the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam? This is a very simple question. When the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, he entered into Medina in Rabi al Awal. So he left Mecca at the end of Safar and he entered Medina in Rabi al Awal on his birthday, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Rabi al Awal, Rabi al Akhar, etc., all the way to the next year, Muharram. The Muharram is the first year of the month. So 11 months later in Muharram, when he came, he found the Jews of Medina fasting on a specific day. So he asked the Jews of Medina, why are you fasting on this day? So they said, this is the day that Allah saved Musa, uh, Moses, and Bani Israel from Pharaoh. 
So we fast out of thanksgiving. And what did the Prophet Sallallahu said? He said, we have more of a right to Moses than you, because he is a prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he ordered the Muslims to fast. And this is the fast of Ashura. Of course, after that came the fast of Ramadan, and the fast of Ashura became a sunnah. But the mentality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is he would see these signs, and he sees Musa Alaihi Wasallam, well, he's our Nabi. What I find every year around this time when people ask this question, not just in this community, but anywhere else, I believe, I was thinking about this this morning when I, was, when I got the questions, I believe the big problem is that many Muslims don't comprehend that these are our prophets too. Not that we, yeah, yeah, we believe in Jesus and Musa, but we, but we, we love them too. Allah says in the Quran, we do not distinguish between the Anbiya, even though we love Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi number one, of course. But when we read the name of Christ Alayhi Salam, or Musa Alayhi Salam, or Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, so on and so forth, these are our Anbiya. So if there is something that honors those prophets, we're going to honor them too. And if there is something to celebrate those prophets, we're going to celebrate them too. But we're going to celebrate them in our way and honor them in our way. So when it comes to things like that, particularly when it comes to Judaism and Christianity, because these are the two, I mean, Christianity is really a subsect of Judaism from the, from the point of view of the history of religions. All of these MBA are in the, or most of those MBA are in the Quran. When it comes to non-Abrahamic faiths, it's a little bit difficult. We'll talk about that in a second. But specifically when it comes to Judaism and Christianity, like for example, when, I'm with, when I do the interfaith stuff and I meet these rabbis in the area, I tell them, you know, we celebrate the Passover too, because these are stories that are in the Quran. So the mentality that the believer has is this mentality of trying to mend any type of differences that may occur. So what is Christmas? Christmas is the day that Christians celebrate the birth of Christ, alayhi salam. So that's a day that we, not only do we celebrate, but Allah Ta'ala mentions it in the Quran, on the tongue of Isa, alayhi salam, salamun alayya yawma walittu wa yawma umutu wa yawma ubaathu hayya, Christ in the Quran is quoted as saying, peace be on me the day I was born, the day I will be, I will die, and the day I will return, or the day I was raised and the day I will return. So the, the specific day of the milad of Isa alayhi salam is mentioned. So if a billion Christians pick a certain day, now obviously he wasn't born on that day, we know that. Th that date was chosen for other political reasons when the Roman Empire became Christian and they were trying to do away with pagan practices <clears throat> but that's not we don't know the birth of any of the mba except sayyidina muhammad sallallahu but if this is the day that we find a billion people on earth or over a billion people celebrating christ 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 there's an opportunity for us to say that we we believe in christ too and we honor christ and then we remind ourselves of why do we love him why do we honor him there's a whole chapter in the quran about mary alayhi salam so on and so forth as far as the way Christmas tree and things like that, I wouldn't do that personally. I'm not going to say it's haram, because haram is a serious word, but I wouldn't do that. Because we have our own way. So we can create our own way of doing this celebration. Whether we talk about it, whether we celebrate the way we do the milad, of the, the maulid of Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa the same thing. So I would not follow the customs. The Christmas tree specifically, there's no real religious symbolism behind it. I mean, you definitely can't go to church and go to mass. That's haram because that's an act of worship. But if your neighbor invites you, you can go sit in the back and just observe. That's different. But you can't participate in the act of a worship that does, that's not Islamic. But the tree itself and things like that, those are just you know Nordic culture. It has nothing to do with the religion. Uh, as far as other religion, uh, other uh, Non-Abrahamic faiths, like Dharmic religions, Hindus, Buddhists, etc. Same thing, the Muslims encountered these religions. It's not like this is the first time we hear about them. When the Muslims were in India for over a thousand years, uh, they encountered this and more. And all of those Buddhist and Hindu temples and the Vedas, all of those were preserved under the auspices of Muslim rule. So obviously the Muslims knew what was going on. So there is this coexistence and this perspective of respect. But we do not merge our faith into their faith, just like they're not going to merge their faith into our faith. Everyone has their own distinct religion. But when we understand what the <clears throat> many, many ulama consider uh, the Vedas to be the books of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, Suhufi Ibrahim al-Musa, the books of Abraham and Moses, 
some of not many some of the ulama say that ibrahim in in one of the recitations of the of the quran ibrahama veda ibrahama hama veda and they say oh the vedas are the books of ibrahim alayhi salam well there's nothing wrong with adopting this view because it doesn't change our religion and we know that there are prophets that were sent before that we don't know their names so on and so forth so we respect all of those organized religions as the wider concept of people of the book and therefore our perspective towards them should be good faith and and good neighborly conduct and uh, finding points that can overlap inshallah however the question also brings up something else which is the fact that we are a minority in this country and that's why it's important that when it comes to our own holidays we make the effort to celebrate them as much as we can one time at, at this mosque when i first started it, it, it happened to be that that juma was the first day of muharram sorry it wasn't at this mosque it was at another mosque and they didn't ask me to come back but that's okay and i i said it's muharram it's the new years and i talked about how in some muslim cultures they they'll make like white cookies with white powdered sugar so that the year, year will be full of white and good and you know it's just like a cultural thing and they put up lights and oh man people got so many. this is about muharram our new year i wasn't talking about the january 1st new year i was talking about our new year and people got offended well if that's how we are then we're going to end up getting questions like this because if our kids if Eid for our kids is having dunkin donuts in a parking lot in a mall and that's it and then for a whole month, it's all this, you know, uh, jingle bell, jingle bell stuff outside. Then it's going to be very hard for them to feel something when it comes to our holidays. So when it comes to our holidays, we should celebrate and embellish. And we do at this mosque, walhamdulillah. Thank you. Okay. Easier question. Does diabetic prick test break your wudu? No, it does not break your wudu. And it also does not break your fasting if you take an insulin shot. Intermuscular shots. Do not break your fast, but intravenous shots break your fast. Because the veins and the arteries are considered by the sharia to be inside the body. So you can't draw blood or you can't have an IV while you're, well, I mean, you can if you need it, of course, but you break your fast. But if you have the insulin shot that's intramuscular, that is permissible. So it doesn't break your wudu and it doesn't break your fast. <clears throat> Usually during the silent prayers, Duhr and As, we recite a surah silently without the knowledge of which surah the Imam recites. And when the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, we go to Rukua. We follow the Imam, but we have not finished the surah. Please clarify. Reciting the surah after the Fatiha is a sunnah. So you don't have to do that. But the Imam, you have to follow because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Innam al Imam li yutaman bihi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Imam's job is that you follow the Imam in prayer. <clears throat> So after you finish the Fatiha, you start, you know, another surah. Uh, maybe you, you even say Bismillah rahman rahim and then the Imam says Allahu Akbar. You say Allahu Akbar and then you go. Now, if you are reciting the Fatiha and the Imam says Allahu Akbar and you haven't finished the Fatiha, then you stand, you remain standing to finish the Fatiha, and then you go into Rukua. Of course, for the Hanafis, they don't do that. They just follow the Imam. But this is for the Shafis and and the others. So if the imam is quick and you don't get a chance to recite your second surah at all or partially, that's fine. Some imams recite the tahiyyat recital quickly is a shorter version. From the minimum, a tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu tayyubatu salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salahin ashadu wa la ilaha illallah that's the shortest thing that you can do. So if you are in the last tashahud, the last rakah, and the imam says salam, salam, and you still are going, you take your time because you're still in prayer and there's nothing else to catch up to. If it's the second rakah of dhuhr, uh, asr, maghrib, aisha, meaning that there's another rakah after that, you're going to say the first part until the shahada, and then you're going to stand. So if you're a little lagging behind, that's okay too. And, and tell the imam, if the imam, me or whoever, that you're too fast, the imam should accommodate that. 
<clears throat> is alcohol uh, in cold medicine okay to take? It's even found in children's medication medicines. In general, the Sharia is very liberal when it comes to medication. Specifically, when it comes to alcohol and medication, the alcohol that's in medication is not placed in the medication with the purposes of getting drunk. It's the purpose other has other pharmaco pharmacological purposes. So from that point of view, it's okay to take the medic medicine if it's prescribed, especially if it alleviates pain, it helps with an illness, etc. Uh, it is permissible to take substances that the Sharia considers najis, ritually impure, as medication, uh, because there are hadith that indicate, uh, like the urine of the cow. It's my like urine is considered najis, but there's a hadith about taking it for medical purposes. So that hadith is, especially in the Shafi madhab, is important to understand this question. In addition, there are different types of alcohol. Alcohol is a chemical family, a family of compounds. Ethanol alcohol is the alcohol that is haram to consume other forms of alcohol, uh, methylene and whatever. I wasn't very good at chemistry, so I'm not going to even pretend like I know what they are. <clears throat> there are enough medical people in the room. Um, those substances, are they do not take the same ruling as ethanol alcohol, like the alcohol that you find in gasoline or something like that. It might be haram to consume gasoline, but for another purpose, because you're going to die, not because it's poisonous, not because it's going to get you drunk, but it takes a different ruling than the specific, the khamr that we have in the sharia. So that's one thing to note. Also, the, the alcohol that's in the medicine is a small portion, usually a small portion of the alcohol. It's not like, you know, 99% proof vodka, you know, that's, uh, no, that's, that's obvious. You can't, you're not going to do that. But if it's cough syrup and the like, furthermore, we take medicine that's even more intense. We take narcotics. When people are in pain, uh, they take narcotics. I mean, it's even more uh, potent and dangerous than the alcohol. And even that's permissible uh, with the prescription of a physician if you're in serious pain and the like. <clears throat> okay. If a woman has missed two Ramadans due to pregnancy or nursing, is she required to make it up all before the next Ramadan when she is planning to fast it? You had said previously that giving money was not the proper way to make up fasting. There's a difference of opinion. The opinion that we give, which is the easier opinion, is that you just simply have to make it up. It doesn't have to be made up before the next Ramadan. So it's a difference of opinion. But I'm, I always give the easier uh, uh, opinion because, you know, when you're, fat, when you're pregnant or you're nursing, you, you know, you're, you're going to miss 30, 60, 90 days. So sometimes it's hard to make all of those up before the next Ramadan. So as long as you just are on a steady schedule of making up your fasts, uh, you're going to be okay, inshallah. Okay, this is a long question. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to give you the highlights of it. <clears throat> uh, given the importance Islam maintains, uh, gives to maintain family relations, are there exceptions to why someone may cut communication with a sibling? Is there any religious obligation uh, of one sibling to another if there's a tremendous amount of unwarranted verbal and psychological abuse taking place. And then she goes on to mention a sister who they think is mentally not well. She married a non-Muslim. Her kids are not Muslims. Uh, and there's sort of a distance between them. So, first of all, every time we have a problem with somebody, we can't just say the, problem, the other person has a mental problem. Okay, that's not going to work. Because if by that token, all of us have mental problems. So let's just avoid, you know, th that determination is for the doctors. Uh, let's just say that you have a sibling in which there's, you know, uh, every time you get together or you talk, it's, it's very negative and very bad. There are, it's not black and white. First of all, don't put yourself in a situation where you don't have any contact at all with your family, because that's one of the drawbacks of living in the Western world, is that the Western world can be very individualistic and you can end up living alone. Even though you're surrounded by people, you're actually alone. And then you find yourself alone. The Prophet ﷺ warned us against that. And he, he disliked that people would go live in the Badia, go live in the desert by themselves. He didn't like that. Even though there were some Sahaba that did that because that maybe there were unique situations. But in general, we are meant to live in community. Right? And that's what Aristotle said, that man is a political animal, meaning that we are meant to live in community, not live by ourselves. The Prophet ﷺ said also maintaining family ties increases in your wealth and increases in your life. It increases in your life either that it adds to your life or it adds breadth, length to your life or it adds breadth to your life. But there is great barakah in being with your family and maintaining ties. 
So don't think about it as black or white. You can send them a message. You can send them an email. You can send them a card in the holiday times or Eid or Ramadan. You can send you, you can send them. You write them a letter by hand. You can you, you can mail it to them. You can mail them a care package. There are many ways to keep the relationship, but don't be the person that doesn't you know contact. Especially she's married to a non-Muslim, which is not permissible. Her kids are not Muslim, which is obviously not good. Maybe you are the will be the reason why they will come back to Islam. Eventually, so don't think about it black or white. Oh, this my sister is crazy. I can never talk. She has mental issues. I mean, that, you're not a doctor to make that determination because I'm sure that she thinks the same thing about you too. So uh, let's look at the gray. There are different ways. Uh, but if every time you talk to somebody, they hit you and they spit in your face, well, obviously you're not going to talk to them. I mean, so you you will you will have a different type of relationship with that person. That's understandable. But pray for them. At least make dua for them. Don't cut off the, the internal relationship with a family member. Especially if it's a first order family member, like a sibling, a parent, a child, etc. <clears throat> okay. During burial, uh, please clarify if the deceased body has to be placed on raw earth. Some countries only allow vaults and cemented walls. What's the general practice, please? The sunnah is that we bury, you know, in, uh, from earth we come and from earth that we return. Allah Ta'ala created us from the genetic material that is the same genetic material of earth, and, and, we are, and we return to that. So the sunnah is that we are buried in the earth, shrouded and buried in the earth. Now, in many uh, states, like in this state, we have to have a cement vault inside the ground, inside the grave plot for environmental purposes. And the cement vault is very big. It's, it can accommodate two, three people if you put them side by side, for example. So it's a very wide thing. So all we do is we put earth in the cement vault. And then after we lay the body down uh, on the right side, then we fill the cement vault with earth. The cement vault is closed, and then we fill up the grave. So we fulfill the sunnah, and that's, that's fine. As a matter of fact, there are other uh, burial practices in Egypt, you would be shocked to know, which is really shocking if, to see it, uh, it, it, because of the high water table in Egypt, in Cairo, because of the Nile, we are not able to bury the normal way, but rather each family has a room under the ground that is opened and reopened every time someone dies. And there are steps that go down, and the men are on the right, the men are on the left, you just lie the body down, put some dirt on them, and you go, it's very freaky. I mean, really, really scary. But in the books of fiqh, it will say, you know, except the graves of Egypt, right? Because there are, there's an environmental issue uh, like that. Or what if you're in the Nordic countries and it's all ice and you can't bury? You might, you might have to put it in a, in a vault to be able to put it under the ground. So there are dispensations because of the way the earth is and, and things like that. But the basic sunnah is that we want the body to be shrouded in the, in the grave and surrounded by earth because that's where we come from. In some cultures, while the body is shrouded fully with two pieces of white cloth, a mound of earth is placed by the cheek for the face to rest. Is this a must? Oh, well, what happens? It's it, not sure. I'm not trying to be so morbid, but if you do this long, if you do this enough, you'll understand that the 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 dead body. It, it's not super. I mean, it, it, it's flexible, but it's he, it's heavy, and the person's dead. They can't move for you. So when you put the body in the grave. You have to prop the body up so that it lies towards the on its right side as much as possible, especially the head facing the qibla. So usually what we do is on the left side, we put earth X like a pillow of dirt or a stone or something like that to help prop the body up uh, so that it's facing. Uh, so that's really what's happening. It's not about dirt on the right cheek. No, the, the body is shrouded, the, the head is covered, and then the feet are covered. So it's kind of like a candy wrapper, and there are two wraps on the top and the bottom, so you don't see any part of the body. And we don't expose the body after we bury the body in the earth, but we do our best to tilt the body towards the right so it faces the qibla, <clears throat> which is why it's important to make sure that you have uh, you know, afterlife plans and that you have a burial plot in a Muslim cemetery, because when you go to a Muslim cemetery, a lot of these things are taken care of for you. 
But if you don't, and you're stuck going to a non-Muslim cemetery, the grave might not be on the Qibla at all. And that, that could be problematic. Could a spouse be allowed privately to view the body of a deceased while the body is being shrouded or after? In this case, the spouse was not present when the person passed away. She was deeply aggravated that she did not get a chance to see the body and was not permitted to see the body even after shrouding with elders saying that wudu is performed on the deceased will get nullified in the Sunni tradition. To this day, the spouse is bitter about this. There are a couple of things with this question. Number one, what I have seen is that people confuse the after death process. They confuse themselves for the deceased. The, the, the job, the minute somebody dies in the community, we want to do everything we can for the person who has passed away. Not so we can feel good about ourselves. The, to honor the dead in Islam is to bury them as soon as possible. Is to wash them, shroud them, and bury them as soon as possible. It is very common in Muslim cultures that many family members are not present during that process because people might be far away. But what's, is it, it, they will feel bad. The living. But what matters is the person who died. Not that I feel good that I was there or not there. What matters is that we do right by that person. That we do all of these things as soon as possible. So I have found that many people that get emotional is because they confuse. They're really, I mean, I, I hate to, it sounds so, I really don't mean any offense to anyone, but they're very selfish. They think it's about them. They are sad. They are upset. They want to speak and let everyone know. But it's not about you. It's about the person who, you know, praying the janeza on and burying. We have to do right by them. There's an order of things. Then after that, then we can, you know, assuage our own feelings. But somebody's going to have to wash the body. Somebody's going to have to shroud it. Somebody's going to have to bring it to the masjid that we pray. Then we're going to have to drive it to the cemetery and bury it and do all of these things and the talqeen and this and that. Make sure that there's a headstone there so we know where the person is. Then we can look to the living. So that's where everyone, it's very, as hard as it is to hear, please, keep, and, and this is a reminder for myself, you know, God forbid if I find myself in that situation, I would want you to remind me of it too. It's not about me, it's about the person uh, who has died. That being said, it's permissible for the wife to see, or a family member to see the face of the deceased after they have died, because the Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu kissed the Prophet Sallallahu between his uh, eyebrows after he passed. He removed the covering from his face and he kissed him. He said, Tip to Hayyan wa Mayitan, Ya Rasulullah. How beautiful you are alive and how beautiful you are dead, Ya Rasulullah. So that's permissible. You know, if we can catch it, if it's, you know, right at the washing time or in the hospital or something like that. But don't take the body all the way to the cemetery and then be like, oh, uh, somebody's FaceTiming from, you know, Timbuktu and we have to, uh, because this has happened. Um, these are real stories. That's not appropriate. Because it's about it's not about the living, it's about the dead. So you can see the face, you know, let's say up until the time of the Janeza prayer, uh, shortly right after the Janeza prayer. But once we start moving to the burial, we want to get the person buried. That's how we honor the dead. Uh, we honor the dead by burying them as soon as possible. <clears throat> as far as the woman being bitter, we can talk to her. Another problem with the question, the way it's phrased, is that we also misunderstand death. Death is not the end of life, but death is moving from one mode of living to another mode of living. So even the deceased in our community, our loved ones, our families, even the people before us, we can have a relationship with them. It's not going to be like this kind of relationship, but you can make dua for them, you can pray for them, you can read Quran for them, you can do charity on their behalf, you can remember them. Uh, we can gather together and read the Quran. You know, each one of us can read a juz and we do a khatam for them, so on and so forth. We could read Yasin for them. We can go to the grave and visit them, so on and so forth. So this is also something for us to, to remember and to be, uh, we have to accept the fact that when Allah Ta'ala calls somebody home, that's Allah's will. And we can't change that. And we have to accept that. And we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make it easy on us, inshallah. I'm not trying to make it seem it's not easy. I know it's hard, uh, I, I, but I'm trying for us to think about having the right way of thinking about it so we don't get caught up in the me 
uh, moment because it's, it's, it's really, I guess really the only way to say it is sometimes people's true selfishness shows at the time of death. And we have to remember that we want to honor the dead. It's not about us. Okay. Can a Muslim and not sorry, non-Muslim men be allowed to view the face of a woman deceased after shrouding? And why would they want to see the what is the, this uh, what's this obsession with seeing people dead people? Khalas, we've shrouded the people, let's bury them, people. You know, I mean if it's in the hospital or something like that or at home, it's one thing, but after we've washed the body and we've shrouded them, <laughs> let's just move on with it. I think this comes in the Western tradition of the um of the wake, right? Where they you go to the funeral home and you pay them a pretty penny and you they put on a good suit and they pump you with whatever they pump you with and then you just sit there and look at the dead. But we don't do that because that's not how we honor the dead. We honor the dead by burying them. What is the talqeen recital at the grave? Uh, talqeen is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ uh, that he said that when, uh, when somebody passes and you put them in the grave, Somebody will stand and call them by their mother's name. So you say, oh, you, the son of, and you mention the person's mother's name. And if you don't know the mother's name, then you say, oh, you, son of Eve, son of Hawa. And you remind them that the angels are going to, why do you do this? Because the person's alive. That's the whole point. It's a different kind of life, but the person's listening to you. So you're telling them the angels are going to come and ask you. What is your religion? Say, Islam is my religion. What is your book? Quran is my book. Who is this man? Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, what, who is your Lord? Allah is my Lord. You know, we're going to be asked these questions and inshallah we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that we may answer them easily and without difficulty. So that's what the talqeen is. It is to stand and to, to speak to the dead, uh, 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 linking them to their mother and coaching them basically is I guess the right word through these questions inshallah. A young friend of ours, who, is also, who also prays five times a day, decided that she did not want to get married, but wanted to have a kid, so she decided to go for in vitro fertilization. Is this religiously permissible? Her defense is that she did not indulge in any illicit relations, but is taking advantage of science. When the child is born and attains the age of 18, the child will be told who the father is. This is haram, haram, haram. Three times, just so we can be clear about that. You can't do that because the only way you can have a child that's recognized in the Sharia is through marriage and then the, consum the sexual consummation of that marriage. Even if the couple can't conceive and they want to have uh, in, in vitro fertilization, it has to be from the genetic matter of the couple. Not a, can't involve a third person. You can't take... Uh, my sperm, my wife's egg, and put it inside and, and get a third person or a fourth person. The child has to have two sets, you know, one set of each parent. That's it for the child to be considered uh, legitimate in the eyes of the Sharia. Just because something is doable does not mean that it's permissible. So, just because we can do something like this, it doesn't mean that it's permissible. This is very haram and, and a, a huge, you know, mistake. We ask the sister to, uh, you know, make tawbah and and I, I don't know how far along she is or any of that. I mean, I'm not going to get involved in those type of details. How about adopting a child? How about taking a child into your care from the gazillion Muslim orphans that we have roaming around the earth? How about that? That's a, that's a solution. You can do that and have a, you know, a kifara taking care of, a, of an orphan. The Prophet Sallallahu praised as a huge, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, fil jannah. Me and the one who sponsors an orphan, it will be like this in the paradise. Sallallahu That's a great hadith. Right? That's a great act. So there are other ways of doing it. <clears throat> so th this is not permissible at all in the Sharia, and it has a, a the child according to the Sharia cannot uh, claim uh, lineage to the father, even if the father becomes known. The, in, in the Sharia, it's called Ibn Zina, you know, the son of fornication. It's really a horrible, a horrible, horrible thing to have to, to carry. So that's not permissible. The next question is actually related. If the married couple decided together to get IVF done as they cannot have kids, what is the opinion of the scholars? As I said, if it involves both of them, then that's fine. But you can't involve a third person or a fourth or a fifth person. Is there an explanation other than a sunnah as to why Zuhr and Asr are read silently? We pray the way that the Prophet 
prayed. Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usali. Pray the way you have seen me pray. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's no necessarily rational, re you can maybe come up with a wisdom behind it. But the, it, the, the answer to the question is that we do it because that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does or did. And our doing it shows our faith in him and our following him. So not everything in, in our religion is going to be a reasonable. Like, why can't we eat pig meat? I really don't know. Because there are other foods that are filthy that we eat <laughs> that are per perfectly permissible. But the, Allah told us not to touch this. So we say, okay, we, we, don't, we won't touch that. So on and so forth. What is the origin of the tashahud? From the uh, story of the Isra and the Ma'raj. Uh, would you... Uh, would you Again, explain if the Prophet is alive or dead in a special state of being different from others who have passed. The Prophet is alive in his grave, as are, is, which is our belief, as is all of the Anbiya. Uh, the Prophet and the Isra and Ma'raj, he said, when I went to Jerusalem, I saw Moses praying by the red sand dune. And if you were with me, I would have shown him to you. Uh, Imam al-Bayhaqi, the famous Hadith scholar, he has a, a book. Uh, about the life of the MBA in their graves. So all of the MBA plural, are alive in their graves. Uh, Allah Ta'ala has also forbidden the earth to decompose the bodies of the MBA. That's also part of our belief. We believe that when we send salam to the Prophet Sallallahu he responds back to us in the tashahud. We directly speak to the Prophet Sallallahu We say, As-salamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi, peace be unto you, O Prophet or uh, O Nabi. The, the calf here is because you're speaking to somebody directly. So, and the, and the many, many, many hadith that speak to that. So that's our that's our belief regarding Rasulullah so, and all of the MBA. Why is it Abraham, and could we salute a few other prophets if we want, oh, in the tahiyyat, in the tashahud? No, in the tashahud, the prayer is not the uh, space for creativity. The prayer is the space for obedience. We want to be creative, we can be creative outside of the prayer. But when it comes, so I'm not going to take the Quran and be like, you know what, I'm going to add a verse here, I'm going to add a verse there. It's, there's, there's no creativity. You just memorize it and read it the way it is. The prayer is you do it the way it is, because it's an act of obedience. If you want to uh, have a special prayer for all of the MBA, you can do that after prayer. That's fine. But not inside the prayer. Inside the prayer is the time that we follow what the Prophet Sassam told us to do. How is getting married to your cousin permissible in Islam when there is research that suggests children born from these relationships have birth defects due to this? Be permissible is one thing, but it's not necessarily recommended exactly for this reason. Marriage is one of those things that's regulated by religion. It's another thing that we forget. In other uh, systems of belief, in other uh, cultures, in other times, uh, people married their siblings, or people married uh, parents, or, or, or whatnot. Uh, I mean, even in some American extreme sects of Mormonism and, and whatnot, that's, that still happens, you know, that type of incestuous relationship still happens, which is why we have clear verses in the Qur'an telling us who we can marry and whom we can't marry. So it is something that is legislated by the divine. And this is one of the reasons behind many of the fuqaha not allowing cross uh, religious marriages, even for Muslim men. So, okay, it's permissible, but doesn't don't. I, I, if somebody came and asked me, I would not recommend it. But there are cultures in which it's very common, um, and uh, not only is it common, but it's a way that you know people can easily get married, and it, it avoids you know these long drawn out you know never ending engagements and things like that. I'm not advocating for it, but I'm saying there are there is a place for it and it happens uh, and the sharia is here to speak to all these different modes not just to what we think like in our cultural understanding it might not make sense but we can't deny that it's permissible why were the angels and shaitan told to prostrate to adam this seems like shirk even though i know that it cannot be right if only allah is supposed to be prostrated to in worship why did this happen similarly the story of prophet yusuf and the stars prostrating to him why did these events happen? Because these are prostration of gratitude and honoring 
which the Sharia has forbidden other than to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So before the advent of Islam, it was a sign of respect or honoring, not, a, not only a sign of worship. Uh, I remember when I was doing some work with some Nigerians, they told me that there are some tribes, even Muslim tribes, till today, where it's common that when they see an elder, they make sujood in front of the elder. Now, I mean, that's from the Sharia, strict Sharia point of view, that's impermissible. You can't do that. But that shows you that it's an inherited practice among some people as a sign of respect. So Adam, Iblis, Yusuf, السلام, these are signs of respect, not of worship. Islam has, our Islam, the Islam of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallam came to confine that act to limit it only to worship. So we cannot prostrate to one another. Uh, nor should we ever prostrate to anyone other than to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayer. And then lastly, well, there are some questions, uh, a couple here, but the, the last one for the, the pre-sent questions, probably the most important question of the night. Is a hair transplant surgery permissible? I think many people go to Turkey to have this done. Isn't this changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And why do you want to hurt people's feelings changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And your wife wants you to get a hair transplant? No, that's permissible. There's nothing wrong with it. Actually, when I went to Turkey in October, I had uh, shaved my head, as many of you knew, in the summer. And everyone in my family was very upset. So I was forced to let it grow back. So when I was in Turkey and my hair was growing back, I looked like I was one of those people that had the surgery. So my kids kept making fun of me. And on the, you know, you go to Turkey and everyone's fine, but on the flight back, you know, half the flight is, uh, <laughs> no, that's fine because, <laughs> because it's your natural hair. And what's not permissible is to wear a wig because that's false. But the, the hair transplant, it's your own hair. That's, that's fine. <laughs> what's yesterday? Oh my God, that was yesterday. Was it yesterday? Oh, subhanAllah. Yesterday, yesterday. Oh, subhanAllah. <laughs> so we, um, we did the salah with um, uh, the food, and us. Because we told that they have food, and we think that that's good. But we people, we were not supposed to go through the state here. We, but, but we also offered us to do it. <laughs> it's, you, can, you can combine the prayers for no reason. So if you joined us yesterday and you prayed Asr with Dhuhr and you weren't going to go to the cemetery, that's fine. There's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. But the reason I did that is because I don't know what time you guys came back, but I, I came back like 4, 4.15. I mean, there was only 20 minutes. That's okay. It's uh, because... No, it's okay that you pray to us because that's permissible. There's an opinion in the Sharia that says that you can combine your prayers. E even if you're not traveling, even if it's not raining, that's okay. So that's fine. I should have mentioned that yesterday. But one time when we did this, we had a burial in, like, I think it was November or December. And we didn't pray Asr. And I remember I almost missed Asr because it's freezing to pray out there in the summit. It's just very, very cold. And they don't want you to stay. They want you to... We had two burials yesterday. I got out of the car and I stood with all these people. And then 10 minutes later, I was like, I don't know who these people are. I was like, Echi, what mosque are you from? He's like, oh, we're from ICM. I was like, ah, wrong burial. So I went back into the car. And then I saw the other people. I was like, oh, that's, those are my mom. These are, this is our death. You know? <laughs> so the guy, he wanted to like for us to finish. So anyway, that's why I did it. <clears throat> I have a, uh, one question. Uh, our family recently experienced a big disappointment, not involving life and death, relationship or loss of wealth, alhamdulillah, but a disappointment nonetheless. What would be the best way to respond in the moment as well as after some time has passed? You know, disappointment, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us uh, patience through it and also teaches us lessons of reliance because oftentimes when I'm disappointed with something, what I'm really disappointed in is that I was attached to an outcome. I want this. And then I didn't get this, so now I'm disappointed. But I mean, you know, I, I, it's, there's really nothing to be disappointed about. It's, I wanted something and Allah didn't want it to happen. So, I mean, I know I'm trivializing it. Obviously, you're probably a big situation. But if you can understand that example, 
then you can understand basically all of our disappointments are that. I wanted to marry this person and it didn't work out. I wanted it, I want, I was attached to an outcome, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want that outcome. Now I wanted to get married to this person and I got married to this person, I'm very happy. Right? I'm very happy because I got what I wanted. Or am I happy because Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put someone in my path to get married? There's a difference. So on and so forth. So the biggest lesson of disappointment, and look, disappointment is disappointing. It sucks. It's not good. We feel bad that we, when we're disappointed. We're upset. And that's the point. The point is Allah Ta'ala is teaching us only rely on me. Don't rely on you or don't rely on so-and-so or don't rely on a certain outcome, but rely on me and me alone. And don't think that any disappointment that you face, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala will not compensate you for it later. He might compensate you in this world with something better, or he might save it for you, which, will, which, we, we, which is better for us in the long run on the, in the hereafter. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala will never let anything that we do go to waste. No action that we do, no good work that we do, no smile that we've made or helping hand that we've lent, nothing will go to waste. It will all be reserved for us and preserved for us. So sometimes the disappointment is for us to reflect on these things and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you and your family and all, everyone else who is going through difficulty. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us all, inshallah. Uh, there's no more questions. We're going to pray Aisha now, right? Okay. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك ومداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون